is Robert Jarnason from the Citizens Foundation in Iceland. Um, the Citizens Foundation is a non-profit organization that was uh, founded uh, at the end of 2008 and it's a direct uh, result of the crash uh, of the economic crisis that uh, happened in Iceland uh, in 2008. Um, uh, as you probably many of you know, then uh, Iceland was one of the first uh, countries that got uh, really badly hit uh, by the economic crisis. Basically, uh, overnight, all the commercial banks in the country went bankrupt. People did not know if they could actually uh, access uh, uh, their uh, cash machines to get their money out. It was a total chaos. And uh, what happened is that uh, uh, as a result of this, uh, people who had been living a rather comfortable life suddenly uh, asked themselves, what have those politicians we uh, voted uh, been doing uh, for all this time to actually make this situation happen? So we uh, uh, decided uh, as a group of people, group of friends, that, uh, uh, that we all come from the internet business. Uh, we uh, uh, decided to try to uh, uh, create uh, both technologies and processes uh, that would uh, use the internet to empower people uh, to uh, uh, have more influence on what the political uh, representatives were doing. And basically focusing on improving democracy through technology. And uh, uh, it's important uh, that uh, uh, this opportunity that uh, opened up uh, in the crisis, we try to look at the positive uh, sides of a crisis like this. I guess the same thing is uh, happening here in Spain. But there's an opportunity to actually uh, make some changes. And, uh, and hopefully uh, those changes are uh, going to be for good. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, in general, the citizen participation uh, in Iceland. Uh, how that is progressing, and uh, specifically about uh, our new constitution that uh, has been uh, now in development over the past uh, year or so. So uh, Iceland is a, is a, well, it's not a tiny country, but it, we have very few people living there. There's only 330,000 people in the whole country. And uh, the, the country has uh, the highest internet uh, penetration in the world. 93% uh, of, of people in Iceland actually use the internet or have used the internet uh, to some extent. Even like my grandparents uh, use it and uh, uh, you know, they're on Facebook and uh, it's, it's, it's you know, quite unique that uh, you have a, a whole range of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, people from uh, 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 both young people and old people who are uh, uh, so well uh, uh, sort of connected. And, uh, and it's a it's a good place for trying out new different things because it's easy to uh, get uh, introduce new things to people, uh, even like word of mouth is easy. You know, as soon as uh, uh, something new is uh, and an exciting is happening in the society, uh, then uh, uh, everybody knows about it in a few days or or sooner, especially with uh, with with, uh, with, with, with the internet. So uh, uh, and basically. Uh, uh, the, uh, as I said earlier, the crisis created an opportunity for uh, uh, trying out something new and, and the new ways of uh, giving people uh, uh, access to power. Uh, we started uh, in the Citizens Foundation, we actually started our first project was called Shadow Parliament and was uh, basically connected to the national parliament where we uh, uh, had, uh, uh, were taking uh, information from the Icelandic Parliament and giving people uh, the uh, opportunity to comment and to, to, you know take a bit more active part in what's happening in the Parliament. This was a test project and uh, not a lot of people participated, but uh, it was a very valuable experience because uh, our uh, next project we did was called uh, and it's called Better Reykjavik. And uh, Better Reykjavik is a uh, uh, website application that. Uh, allows people to uh, participate and come up with ideas about what's, uh, what uh, decisions should be made uh, for the local city. And uh, it's important that uh, uh, when you look at participation, to get people interested in participating, uh, doing it on a local level where you're doing it in a city uh, is actually probably a good place to start to get people uh, interested and uh, used to uh, uh, using those sort of tools and actually taking more active part. Because uh, when you compare what's happening on a national level, 
there's a lot of things happening on the national level that uh, a lot of people are not that interested in. But uh, if you do it in on, on a city level, where you're dealing with schools, you're dealing with uh, health services, you're dealing with uh, fixing your street and parks and things like that, those are all issues that are uh, quite close to people's hearts. And people are uh, actively interested in, uh, in many of those things. Uh, we opened the website a week before the last uh, city election, which was in 2010, and we offered all of the political parties a website. Uh, we, uh, a website where uh, people could uh, come up with ideas, prioritize those ideas, and uh, most importantly, debate those ideas. Because an idea is, uh, uh, and ideas are interesting, but even more interesting is why it is a good idea or why it is a bad idea. This was very successful, but only with one of the political parties. Only the best party, which uh, was a, a brand new party that uh, was offering itself in the last city election, they uh, started out as sort of a joke party. Uh, there was no politicians in this, in this party. So the comedians, punk rockers, and uh, generally uh, people who are not connected to politics in any way. And, uh, and their campaign was very much uh, 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 based on, uh, uh, for example, their main campaign promise was that they promised that when they got into power, and if they would get into power, they would break all their campaign promises right away. That was the first thing they would do. And, uh, and, uh, and all sorts of things like that that were sort of, you know, more sort of comedy than actually uh, a, a political campaign. So uh, what they did, as soon as we offered them to use this Better Reykjavik website, they basically started to, they put it on, on their main website. In all interviews uh, that they did, they, uh, they talked about it and basically said, you know, to the people, go to the website, put in the ideas that you think that we should focus on and help us prioritize what's the most important thing for the city to actually do. And uh, we had uh, over 40% of the voters in, in Reykjavik participated in this process, where uh, we had uh, uh, over 1,000 ideas were created in a matter of 10 days. And, uh, and many of those ideas ha actually were then implemented uh, as promised. Even if they had promised to break their own campaign promises, they did listen to uh, the ideas that were coming from the people. There was a lot of people that were uh, skeptical about this. They said, uh, yeah, people are just gonna put in ideas that are uh, gonna be very expensive and we're never gonna be able to afford it and we can't really trust the people with uh, so much direct power. Uh, those people were pro proven wrong. There was all sorts of ideas that were uh, added and uh, many of the ideas were actually uh, 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 for saving money. Uh, on different things. And uh, uh, the situation now, the best party won the election by a landslide. They got over 40% of the vote, and they are now in power, and they uh, made Better Reykjavik an official part of the Reykjavik city administration. So now uh, uh, every month, at the end of every month, the top ideas in 10 categories are actually go directly into processing by the city and if it's possible for the city to implement, then uh, uh, it's uh, uh, what, what the people w uh, want is implemented. But even if uh, an idea, for example, comes in that's not possible to implement for some reason, uh, the system handles the communication to let people know why it's not possible to implement this idea. Um, I do have some few screenshots. Uh, obviously, it's, it's all in, in Icelandic, but... Uh, it's basically, uh, you know, a list of ideas and uh, and uh, uh, looking at the ideas from different angles. We have like the top ideas of the past seven days. We always show like r also random ideas, and uh, it's a r relatively uh, simple user interface. Uh, so we're going to talk about this screen a bit because we uh, uh, the discussion in Iceland at the time was very uh, argumentative. People were arguing a lot about different things. So we thought, how are we gonna make the website work? So uh, instead of having arguments, can we create that debate where people are actually debating the issues in a constructive way? 
So we did a relatively simple thing, which was to split the screen in two. So on the left side of the screen, people who uh, are supporting the idea, uh, they add their uh, points and arguments for the idea on the left side. And people who oppo oppose it, they put the, their argument on the right side. And this has worked incredibly well, even if it's very simple, that uh, instead of arguing where one person says blah, 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 and the other person says, oh, no, you're wrong, people have to uh, actually put constructive points what the, uh, uh, why the idea is bad or why it's good. Uh, we have a, a service called Your Priorities, which is actually the service that runs the Better Reykjavik website. And uh, we, have a, we have a free uh, free website for every country in the world. This is a sort of a debate platform. And uh, all the software is open source and anybody can use it for their own cities or communities. And we have projects now in Italy, we have projects in America. Uh, somebody contacted me from Portugal yesterday. People here from Spain ha have been in, in contact. And uh, uh, we're hoping that as many people can uh, use our experience as possible. Um, there's some screenshots of, uh, yeah, at, at the top you see uh, the countries of the world, and uh, if the country is blue, that means that somebody has added some ideas in that category. We went to a conference in Greece at the end of 2010, and uh, where we introduced uh, this concept, and we had already a few thousand people uh, in Greece that participated over, uh, over a few weeks period, and uh, it was quite interesting. The top three prior priorities that uh, those 2,000 Greek people came up with were to, uh, the top priority was to uh, have the church pay property taxes like everybody else. The second highest priority was to remove immunity from prosecution from uh, the parliamentarians. And the third uh, highest priority was to uh, protect democracy by all means. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a bit about the constitution process in Iceland. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, people were asking about the most during uh, 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 when the crisis happened was if the constitution could be improved to uh, make sure that uh, this does not happen at least at as badly again. And, and we, have a, we have a website, a debate platform specifically for the constitution which those screenshots are from. And uh, the process started with the so-called uh, pots and pans revolution in Iceland, where uh, people basically went to the street and they were, uh, they were protesting. They didn't even know what they were protesting. They were just protesting uh, why we were in that situation. And, uh, but, and there was, they were protesting the bankers, the government, similar, I guess, as, as here in Spain. But there was uh, one main uh, argument that people kept on saying, we need a new constitution. So the current Icelandic constitution is uh, actually has not changed very much since uh, uh, 1944 and not even that much since 1918. Iceland only became independent from Denmark in 1944 and uh, the constitution has changed very little. The parliament has been trying to change the constitution for 40 years. There's been a committee for 40 years trying to change it, but the parliament is just has been unable to change it themselves. And uh, and many Iceland people uh, want a more modern and uh, a more efficient constitution to set up the principles uh, how the country should uh, uh, work. Uh, the first step in the process was a national assembly where uh, 1,000 people were randomly selected from the population. And, uh, and, this, uh, and those, pe this, those people met over a one day period and set up a set of principles that should guide the constitution process. And uh, people were sat together on, on tables uh, using a certain system where uh, uh, everybody would discuss on each table what, the, what their priorities were, what were the most important things you know, for them personally. And uh, then those things were written down on special cards. And then uh, at the end of the process, those cards were collected and using a sp specific method, uh, out of it came, uh, for example, this. This is like a sort of a word cloud that uh, is uh, saying what are the sort of top concepts that came out of this. And this is like, uh, you can see in there, well, it's in Icelandic, but it's like constitution, health service, 
national resources, education, equality. So uh, uh, this was a very important thing to uh, actually uh, uh, to, to, to set the tone for how the constitution process should go forward. Then the next step was that uh, the a constitution council of 25 people was elected. And uh, uh, 524 people actually offered themselves to be a part of this council. And then 25 of them were uh, elected. It was a very strong will, both by the government and the, the people on the council, and to give citizens a very strong voice in this process. That even if we had those 25 people that were elected to do the job, to write the new constitution, they wanted to have a very good dialogue and an effective dialogue with uh, uh, the citizens during the same time. And uh, it's just uh, some photos of how how this was set up. There was a uh, rented the hall and, you know, desks and chairs, you know, basic thing to, you know, set up something like that. And uh, it was decided to use uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, basically as the tools to uh, allow people to take part in the process. I think why uh, there are more specialist tools, for example, our, like, your priorities platform, which runs Better Reykjavik, which is more specific and there's a, uh, in many ways, a better debate platform than Facebook. But the thing is that over 80% of Icelandic people are on Facebook. So uh, using Facebook comments was actually a very efficient way of getting as many people to participate as possible. And uh, uh, so, uh, but it, it was not an, uh, it was not like a regular Facebook comments where people are just talking between themselves about different things. It's, uh, it's actually the people talking between themselves, but also talking to the council. So the people on the council were very effective and they were online uh, taking part in the discussion. And many of the things in the constitution either got modified and actually some parts of the text of the constitution actually came from citizens just through using those Facebook comments. It, it worked really, really well. And uh, there was also a Flickr feed, you know, photos. YouTube was used exten extensively for uh, speeches and things like that. And uh, yeah, obviously Facebook and, uh, and there was also a Twitter. Uh, the, they monitored Twitter to uh, give people who were using Twitter. People don't use Twitter as much uh, in Iceland as here in Spain. But the people who wanted to use Twitter, they could also comment on the process on Twitter. And they were being listened to by the members of the council. And uh, the situation today is that last Saturday, uh, the new constitution draft was put uh, up for a non-binding referendum to the citizens of Iceland. And uh, we had uh, about 50% of people participated. Some people were a bit disappointed that there were not as many people who participated than 50%. But still, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, there may be two main reasons why there were not more people who participated. One of the reasons is that some people were uh, basically just not that interested. Uh, we, we usually have over 80%, 85% of, uh, of turnout on uh, sort of national elections. But uh, also the conservative party of Iceland, uh, even if they officially supported the, uh, uh, the, the, the process and this referendum, then uh, some of the grassroots movement in the Conservative Party basically told people to stay at home. And there's a classic thing in, uh, in, in this process, and I guess it's the same in any country in the world, where, where we have uh, you know, people on the left who want to change a lot of things, and we have people on the right who want to go slower and, do and not change things as quickly. And uh, obviously, all of those views need to be respected. Uh, but the people who actually did participate, Two-thirds of them uh, approved the constitution, or the, that, the, that the draft that was created by the Constitution Council should actually be used as the basis for the new constitution. Uh, there were also six specific questions that were uh, uh, left to people to answer, including uh, if uh, the national resources of Iceland should be specifically uh, named as a joint ownership of everybody in the country, if the state and the church should be separated, 
and uh, if there should be more direct democracy. And, and uh, people are very positive on all those points, except that, uh, uh, that uh, maybe the, uh, one big surprise was that people did not want to uh, separate the, the Protestant church from uh, the constitution. They still wanted to have the church as an institution. That's uh, a surprise, but, uh, but that's, that's, what the people, that's what people want, the majority of people. And uh, just finally, then uh, the next steps in this constitution process is that uh, now a debate in the parliament will happen. And we also have a debate platform set up for the public to take part in that. And uh, the old constitution of Iceland states that only parliament can change the constitution. And a new constitution needs to be ratified by two parliaments. So we have uh, an election coming up now in March, and it's uh, very likely that this parliament is going to ratify the new constitution. But after the election, the new parliament also needs to ratify it for it to take effect. And this is sort of a safeguard, and I believe that this is also the same in the Spanish constitution. And uh, uh, yeah, I think people are mo moderately positive that, uh, that the process will work, and we will get a new constitution sometimes next year. And, uh, but it does depend on uh, a bit how the new, uh, uh, how the election goes. And uh, how many people wanna be more conservative and, uh, and, uh, and the people who want to uh, make big changes. So thank you. Want to, uh And if you have any questions, uh, I, I unfortunately don't speak Spanish, so if you have questions, somebody needs to translate for me, but... La tendríais que traducir porque se la voy a tener que hacer en castellano, en catalán. Vale. Eh, bueno, un poco para la sala, pero también para él. Es de inteligentes aprender de los, de los errores propios, pero es de sabios aprender de los errores ajenos. El compañero islandés nos ha, nos ha presentado un modelo que se ha intentado en Islandia, pero que no ha concluido. Y no ha concluido porque el poder constituido islandés continúa ejerciendo su poder y ahora tiene la sartén por el mango. ¿eh? Lo tiene en base a los partidos anteriores y en base a los partidos nuevos. Ambos son poder constituido. Y la pregunta va, ¿qué cree el compañero que hubiera sucedido si además de haber utilizado las nuevas tecnologías de participación directa por la ciudadanía, el pueblo islandés hubiera estado movilizado continuamente, como estuvo en el 2009, y dejó de estar seguramente por ese proceso o por lo que fuera y porque los bancos estaban ya devolviendo el dinero a los particulares. O sea, ¿cómo podemos, ¿qué podría haber pasado? ¿No, ¿No cree el compañero que hubiera podido tener mucho más éxito un proceso constituyente independiente por parte del pueblo y sin contar con el poder constituido en ningún momento? Gracias. Vale. Eh, damos otra pregunta y después responde Robert, ¿vale? ¿Alguna, alguna pregunta más? Sí, la revolución en las calles fue la clave para este proceso empezar. Y... But uh, even if people have not been protesting in the streets since, there has been mobilization uh, online, people were having meetings, things like that. And uh, even if Iceland now is, uh, is recovering pretty well from the crisis, there's still uh, a lot of anger. And there's a lot of people uh, that, uh, that really want to see things changing. And uh, yes, the process would probably happen different if uh, there would have been continuing street protests. And the government basically uh, 
uh, well, after the crisis, the, the government resigned, basically, and the new government uh, took over. And this was uh, more of sort of a, of a left-wing government that wanted to make more changes. So uh, uh, the people uh, really didn't have that big of a reason to continue to protest in the street because uh, uh, the government was doing what they wanted. Sí, es una pregunta sobre cuál fue, o sea, creo que se ha apuntado ya aquí, eh, lo que acabas de decir, cuál fue la reacción del gobierno eh, a las protestas, al proceso, o sea, hubo criminalización, en qué grado, hubo un apoyo institucional, o no? si hubo un apoyo institucional al proceso, o hubo criminalización, o hubo represión, y en qué grado pasaron estas cosas. Yes, uh, well, I, uh, the thing is that the government did support the process, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the left wing, the left uh, Green Party, and the Social Democrats uh, in, in Iceland, they very much support this process. And uh, they uh, are fighting for it, and uh, they are working on mobilizing people to support it. So, uh, the, but the institutions, like the bureaucracy in, uh, in Iceland, as I guess in any other country, is very resistant to change. It's very hard to uh, get people to uh, agree on uh, making big changes. And, uh, and uh, it's, an, uh, it's interesting that, uh, for example, the best party in the, in the Reykjavik City election, when they won, they came into power and they wanted to change a lot of things quickly. But they quickly found out that actually making changes in a bureaucracy, the bureaucracy has a life of its own as an institution. And it's difficult to uh, make changes. It was a lot harder for them to make the changes they wanted to do. I mean, it took us, for example, after the election, it took us about nine months to actually, you know, get the Better Reykjavik website integrated into the city council because uh, even if the bureaucracy was not against it, it was just every step of the way, people resist change. So we have to end with the questions. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. And Robert will be later in the work. Bueno, Robert va a estar después en el taller de verdadera democracia, o sea que quien quiera participar podemos seguir la discusión con él.